welcome to Always Take Notes. If you're an aspiring author, you'll be excited to hear that this week's sponsors are Curtis Brown Creative, the renowned writing school affiliated to the major literary agency. Since launching in 2011, over 150 of their students have gone on to get major book deals, including acclaimed authors Jesse Burton, Claire Pooley and Kirsty Capes. CBC run a wide range of courses for writers at different stages of their creative journeys. Their new four-week online course, Plot and Story, The Deep Dive, is the perfect next step for any fiction writer struggling to weave the threads of their narrative together. Exclusive teaching videos, resources and writing tasks from best-selling author Laura Barnett will teach you the most useful theories of story structure and show you how to use them to shape your plot. Plus, all students will be given the opportunity to get individual feedback from one of CBC's expert fiction editors. Visit www.curtisbrowncreative.co.uk to find out more about all the courses on offer. Curtis Brown Creative have provided an exclusive discount for Always Take Notes listeners. You can use the code ATN20 for £20 off the full price of Plot and Story, The Deep Dive, or any other four or six week online writing course. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Simon and I spoke with the novelist David Mitchell. We spoke to David about his multiverse approach to fiction, the smash hit that was Cloud Atlas, and his screenwriting work. It's a great episode. We hope you enjoy it. So David, welcome to Always Take Notes. It's it's great to have you on the show. Um, I wanted to start by asking about this idea of the multiverse, this idea that your novels, although they're separate narratives, that in a sense they form this fictional universe with characters reappearing between them. And there was a, a point about Utopia Avenue particularly that I, I picked up on, or a couple of them that, is it, um, I don't know if it's Jasper or Jasper de Zoot, but he listens to a recording of the Cloud Atlas sextet composed by Robert Frobisher, who's a character from Cloud Atlas. And Jasper is also a descendant of Jakob de Zoot, the protagonist from the Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zoot. So it seems that everything, although these are separate, these are all kind of knitting together. How, is that something you'd always wanted to do from the start? Or is that just how it's come to be? It's something I didn't know I always wanted to do at the start. And I should also say thank you very much for having me on your show, by the way. That was a nice introduction. But then your question got really interesting, so I forgot to say thank you. So thank you and your question. Um, By which I mean, um, I started to do it just with my second book. I just put a couple of things in from my first because I liked it when other authors did it. Uh, I just thought it was cool. It was no more literary or world shaking than that I'm afraid and then I did it again with Cloud Atlas a few bits and pieces from Ghostwritten and, and Number Nine V my first and second books by my fourth book however when I had a, uh, a kind of a major minor character uh, from Cloud Atlas appearing as a much older woman in Black Swan Green set in England in the 1980s she'd appeared in Cloud Atlas in the 1930s when she was um a girl pretty much, Uh, I noticed she brought a load of baggage with her and it still worked if you, if you hadn't met her in Cloud Atlas, kind of, it it, it didn't make the uh, narrative incoherent, but she brought all of these freebies with her, these associations, this shared history, uh, this backstory. If you did know who she was before, uh, then she brought these things. If you believed in her before, then she sort of brought this, this reality concreteness, with her into Black Swan Green. That's interesting, I thought. And I did it again a couple more times. Um, Thousand Autumns, as you say, the historical novel set in Japan. Uh, And then between there and the Bone Clocks in 2015, I think there are even more connections. By the Bone Clocks, I realized, and this is uh, by way of an answer to your question, uh, I realized it was doing something else as well. It was letting me satisfy two simultaneous yet contradictory wishes uh, in terms of the kind of writer I wanted to be. When I was a kid and fantasizing and daydreaming about being a novelist, I wanted to be Tolkien. I wanted to be Ursula Le Guin. I wanted to be Isaac Asimov. I wanted to write these great big cathedral sized narrative beer moths. Um, 
I wanted to be a maximalist, we might say. Uh, yet, once I became a published writer, I was also sort of too magpie minded to give the whole of my writing life to kind of one single narrative in installments. Um, uh, I was interested in a Dutch enclave in Nagasaki uh, during the time that Japan was closed to the outside world. I was interested in one year in the life of one kid in muddy Cold War England. I was interested in minimalist things, in, in other words. I, I, I wanted to be a minimalist. Now, by what's the verb? By, 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 by morphing together, by schmooshing, by, by nurturing, by fractaling a kind of a multiverse, I get to be both at once. I get to write my individual books. If you've never read anything by me before and you read Utopia Avenue, my last novel, and you read that and think, well, I'm never reading anything by him again, then uh, the book will still make sense. It still stands as a coherent narrative. However, if you've read one or two or three or four or five or six or however many I've written uh, other of my books, uh, then it will still make sense, but in a somewhat different way, sort of it, it, the light bounces off it in a slightly different way and, and, and just slightly different things to your understanding, I think. Um, so, that's sort of become why I've done it. I mean, there's one or two other reasons as well, but um, but but we'll, but I'm sure you've got a list of other things to work through, and I don't want to bang on about the same point all day. But uh, you're very welcome why... to <laughs> <laughs> quickly. Then uh, it's adding up to something. There are loose ends. There are characters. I think of all of my characters as potential returnees. When you start to think of them like that, you also start to think about. I start to think about my books as a kind of a game uh, or building up to a game, some kind of a war, some kind of con some kind of a confrontation, but what the rules are and what the sides are and what the prize is, I'm not quite sure, but there's this sort of momentum towards a kind of Avengers Assemble novel in a couple of books time that I'll try and get done. Um, it'll, be, it'll be big and hairy, but most of the things I've done are as well. So um part of the course we, we can all look forward to the billion dollar franchise then that's, um, that's coming out of the uh, <laughs> so, coming out of so. these novels well that, that was actually my next question was how you decide which characters and which sort of themes will recur across your books is there something in particular you're looking for or is it more ad hoc than that uh, which characters and which themes did you say there rachel sorry oh uh, yeah how you how you decide what connections you're going to forge across across novels in a sense it goes back to my first uh reason is it cool uh, how do you how do you define cool and what cool is? And again, it's not a uh, a terribly literary or recondite idea. Uh, I don't really know, but 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 you know when you come across a cool idea, you know when you think, ah yeah yeah yeah, I, you could do that. I could bring that character from there. No one would be expecting that. I wouldn't be expecting it. Uh, it just sort of glows in the dark in a particular way that other ideas don't. If it glows in the dark. If I can make the chronology fit, if the character's bringing baggage that 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 that, that will be useful in the destination novel, uh, into the kind of the into novel rather than the out of novel, uh, then then I'll do it. I don't want to just do it for the sake of it, and I don't want to do it too much, and I don't want my novels to start feeling like instalments. I do want them to be standalones. That's kind of my prime directive. But yeah, you just know that's. The characters, the kinds of connections, often they're causal, usually they're character based. If I can think of some others, though, then uh, then I'm certainly up for it. The thing I'm working on now, I'm trying to think of some some brand new types of connection. Connections, one of those rather performative words that everyone agrees is a good idea, but often doesn't really mean very much. Uh, but just yeah, just because of some things I've been reading. Recently, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea that things are only real when they do connect, that reality is a sort of matrix of nodes, of intersecting lines. It's only actually the intersections are really real. Uh, I, I, I've, I've been reading um, Helgoland, a book by Carlo Rovelli, the, the, the Italian quantum physicist who's done a lot to popularise cutting edge ideas of his science for civilians like myself. And, and, and he says something... I, of course, it's one of those books I completely understand uh, up until about 24 hours after I've finished reading it, then it all gets a bit murky again. But uh, but the gist is, um, at a quantum level, 
things are only real when when they're intersecting, when they're interacting. Uh, I think also something rather metaphorically akin to that occurs at, um, at, an, at an emotional and a humanistic level as well. Any really real when we're intersect when we're interacting with another human being, or we're real in a different way to when we're real on our own in our rooms. And it might be a long, deep conversation with someone who's known you for almost all of your life, or it might just be an interaction with a friendly Polish cleaner yesterday in a hotel in Cork who was laughing at me trying to discover which of my eight pockets I'd put my mask into because I was walking, I was attempting to reach the lift without having to put my mask on, but then she approached me with her mask on. And, and she's one of those things, I, I, um, little things like that can set you up for the day. We've all felt that. How come? And it's something to do with us being real in a different way when, when we're interacting with another human being. Um, it's these connections, in other words. And I'm pretty sure I answered a question there at some length, which you didn't even ask. Uh, we'll see if I do that again in the course of the hour. Can I? Can we roll back, David, now to the, the uh, your early part of your life and your initial interest in creativity or writing and particularly building these worlds? And I, I saw in another interview you'd done that your mother used to give you sheets of A1 paper as a way to, to occupy you. And I was interested in that, but also in, in the influence that having artistic parents had on you, particularly in particular this idea that creativity is about work and consistent work as much as it is about a moment of inspiration or things like that. Yeah, sure. Both of those are true. Uh, Mum would uh, greet the Monday of a half term uh, by bringing in uh, a drawing board, big, heavy wooden plywood drawing board, big sheet of proper A1 cartridge paper of the type she did watercolours on masking tape around the edges it was fixed it was stuck there this was this wasn't a kid's pad this was artistic apparatus and you weren't going to waste it everything you put on this piece of expensive cartridge paper had to count uh, I used to draw maps it was the maps of fantasy lands that um that occupied me you know um the maps of middle earth or maps of the hobbit uh it's the maps I loved almost as much as the narratives. Just loved exploring them and the world built. I, I sensed the depth, the days, weeks, months, years of the world building that was, that was the iceberg, which these maps were the tip of. Uh, and I wanted to emulate them and make my own. And yeah, perhaps not my first exercises in narrative building, but certainly in world building. All narratives have to happen somewhere, right? Kind of there is a where as well as a who and a what and a why and a when. There's also a where. And I used to, yeah, spend the whole of, uh, I wish I still had a few. I don't, but um, uh, they would have been highly derivative, no doubt. But while I don't remember the maps themselves, I do remember just the hours and hours of, no, not the hours and hours. I remember hours and hours passing as if it was a quarter of an hour and I'd start in the morning and suddenly it'd be tea time and the day had gone and I'd, and and my reward for that day was uh, a drawing board full of world full of dripping raw 11 year old world and um, I remember that secondly a uh, slightly different question but yes um, mum and dad were artists still are um, elderly of course but dad had a more regular salaried job at the long defunct Royal Worcester Porcelain Company in the design department there. Mum painted watercolours, mostly for greetings cards, sometimes for commercial purposes, wrapping paper, that kind of thing. And this wasn't really something she showed us, it was just a fact of life. Uh, she would disappear on Saturday morning up to her studio with a vase, with a vase of flowers with radio four on in the background we had to be reasonably quiet we'd come in and out depending on what age we were uh and by tea time again that vase of flowers would be transferred onto her drawing board with some beautiful watercolor she, she 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 was and is she really really good uh if anyone wants to search for on twitter uh, at jenny uh underscore mitchell i think all in capitals but hey She's great. Uh, and those pictures paid for our food. Those pictures paid the bills. Those pictures turned into Kit Kats in our lunch and, and then penguin biscuits in our lunch boxes the next week. Uh, that was what art did. Uh, art could feed you. 
it didn't matter if you were in the mood, you couldn't wait for the muse to come along because uh, because the lunch boxes were needed next week. The bills had to be paid. So you painted. That was what art was for. She loved it. She enjoyed the work. Uh, and there was this sort of Protestant utilitarian angle to that relationship with art, which, well, my editor who is having to wait for my next book <laughs> of rather increasing delays while I slightly try my hand at other things we won't be getting around to might disagree but I think I've inherited some of that don't hang about life isn't that long bills need to be paid uh and um and that um also by David Mitchell column of books at the beginning of my books won't get longer by itself but that's up to me only me I've got to do that so yeah uh, I think there's a connection there and to uh linger on your formative years a bit longer am I right in thinking there were some adolescent misadventures in poetry oh god yeah 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 misadventures would be uh, um, a very kind word for my for my uh my offenses against poetry my my my, my adolescent um vandalisms of the notion of poetry yeah yeah uh, I um uh, I used to write poems for the parish magazine for Malvern Wells parish magazine I think Handley Swan parish magazine as well I used to slip them into the vicar's letterbox at night because uh you can't be a teenage kid in middle class lower middle class England going to compend school and write poetry you just can't it, 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 there's no why like everyone knows why you just can't and that was the first time I ever saw my work in print anonymously you're going to ask me for my pen name now aren't you yeah I mean if you're offering <laughs> <laughs> it's out there somewhere uh actually it's in black song green read black song green and you'll get the answer hey <laughs> you see what I did there this is jumping forward a little bit from from adolescent poetry but can we talk about Japan and, and what took you to Japan when you were a a young man you, you went to Italy to Sicily first right and then and then to Japan like how how did that come about and then what was it like arriving there and getting to grips with the culture and the language and that sort of thing the two experiences were pretty different really Sicily was just an extension of a summer job I had teaching English at a language school in Broadstairs in Kent uh, and it was just off the back of that I was only there for eight months I was always going to come back and in a sense, I don't compare. I mean, that was my first time away from home and, and I made the mistakes and learned the things that young people do the first time you move away from the cocoon of home or halls of residence at college. Great memories. And at this distance, they're only good memories. But um, boy, was I green. Japan was, was a sort of departure for some kind of greater order. I, I, was, I was there for about eight years in the end. Uh, oldest cliched uh predictable reason uh that's probably f- f- the one floating through the front of your minds at the moment a uh, young lady was involved uh and so when she went back to japan uh, i went back with her and you either get on with japan and can stay or you don't and you leave within a year uh and, and no honor or dishonor either way it, it, it sort of comes down to personality types really but I did get on with Japan and I I, I quite enjoyed the um gaijin-ness the, the 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 isolation and the way that um when you don't speak the mother language of a place you can switch off and ignore what is quite a noisy urban environment it was a very noisy uh, urban in- environment both visually and sonically uh, much much more easily than native so it's weirdly kind of restful if you don't speak Japanese the less Japanese you speak the quieter Japan is uh, in some ways I learned lots uh, I mean I, I came of age there in, in the sense I was 24 when I went sure but um, uh, I prob- I'm probably not the only 24 year old in, in, in having the body of an adult male but the mind of a kid really and uh, and I left when I was 32. So all the development that happens between those pretty formative years, I mean, what ages aren't formative, but 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 they're pretty formative. Uh, they, they happened in a Japanese context, became a, I, I arrived as an English teacher, backpacker kind of, um, that, that I, I had nothing to keep me in the UK really. It was, it was sort of the end of the John Major recession. There was, there were no jobs here anyway. Uh, I didn't have the beginnings of a career. Uh, and, I, and, and I didn't have the wisdom to think that now might be a good time to think about getting on some kind of 
a ladder. It just didn't occur to me. So many things didn't occur to me. It's a, a recurring motif in my life. And, and I've been really fortunate in that it's more often been to my advantage than to my disadvantages. But it, it didn't occur to me that uh, there was anything wrong with drifting around in East Asia for a while. But as it happened, I stayed in Japan and, um, and I guess learnt my art there or taught myself the art there, or maybe a combination of both. And certainly my development with language, or my relationship with language became kind of richer and deeper there than it hitherto had been. So did you write your first unpublished novel while you were in Japan? Yeah, yeah. Big, sprawly, messy manuscript. I was um, enjoying your interview with Val McDermott uh, just a few days ago, and, and, uh, and a lot of her things, I was, I was just nodding my head literally saying yep 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 me too <laughs> mine my first thing was was like an abomination it, it, it was probably worse it was probably worse a novel than my poetry 10 years earlier had been bad poetry <laughs> it's even worse uh, but that's okay you finish it you get to the end you then get through this magic and penetrable kind of wall uh, and you come out the other side as a person who who has written a novel it doesn't matter how awful it was it doesn't matter you've done one and if you're lucky you realize it's awful uh because in that understanding must be knowledge as to why it's awful and maybe you know there's a few flecks and grains of little glints of mica which actually weren't awful which actually kind of pretty good and minute percentage of the whole of course but 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 it matters and they're there and you can take them and think about why they're good and grow them and expand them and quite a lot of that first novel got cannibalized over the next one or two or three i'd say um so nothing's really wasted uh you're only in trouble if your first thing is rubbish and you think it's great <laughs> then you're in trouble until you realize why it might why it might not be great or it might really be great and then uh, the best of luck to you. But uh, but I did not spring fully formed from the brow of is it Zeus or Athena. I'm in trouble here with my classical references. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're not Simon and I both no pulling one. faces here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask David about, so, so having having done the sort of novel zero, as it were, how then does Ghost Written come about? Like, how how do you decide to move on to a different project? And then we're really, in, as you know, on the show, to the mechanics of how this all happened. So how did you get an agent? How did it end up getting to a publisher and being accepted and, and stuff like that? Particularly when you're writing a novel in English and you're in a very different culture on the other side of the world. Sure. First, move on. Uh, don't wait by the phone for fame and fortune to come knocking. No one waits by phones these days, but don't look at your inbox for the magic email to arrive and change your life. Uh, the more you wait and look for it, the less likely it is to happen. Uh, I know that makes no sense, but sometimes I think the best philosophy slash religion for writers is Taoism. Kind of just, just kind of get something by not wanting it too badly so this sort of um creative inaction yeah that doesn't make any sense i know but 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 it's still not rubbish so in practice as with val uh got the uh, the writers and artists year but this was just about pre-internet still found 20 names editors and agents uh as the uh, writers and artists yearbook advised uh sent firstly chapters and plot synopses off to 20. Uh, i think about eight editors who uh, at publishers who were publishing similar things ish to this abomination on written and maybe 12 agents lower middle class english comprehensive kid easily intimidated by big posh names so i sort of chose plebeian sounding names that kind of might perhaps be stacking shelves at Sainsbury's as well, maybe. Uh, Mike Shaw was one, it happened to be at Curtis Brown. I picked up just because of that, because it didn't look intimidatingly posh. Sent it off to Mike. He was one of two agents who sent who sent a reply to set saying, yeah, maybe not this one, but let me know what else you're working on. So, so this, was the abo- this was the abomination you were sending out? Yeah, 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 yeah. Through the tiny little bits of feedback. And incidentally, uh, uh, two aspiring writers, sent um a rejection letter these days especially a thoughtful one that's a great result immediately that's a contact for you send a thank you letter back and even a box of chocolates if the mood strikes you uh that's unusual and it's great 
uh, if someone's bothering to write you uh, uh, a properly thought out rejection letter, just give yourself a bit of a pat on the back for that. Most things don't get that. So the bits of feedback I got sort of encouraged me to sort of think that, yeah, maybe this was novel zero and kind of not novel 10, let alone novel one. So around then I was going on a, uh, I, I, I took a coffee off, uh, off my job in Japan and came back to Europe on the Trans-Siberian Express via visit to Okinawa, stay with a friend in Hong Kong, uh, mooched around China for about a month as a backpacker. And then yeah, I got the train from Beijing, stopped off in Mongolia for a bit, and then back to Moscow and then Petersburg. So I was traveling on my own. Um, I was in the habit of writing things in notebooks, just thoughts that I thought were hanging on, that were worth hanging on to, that I'd otherwise forget. And I wrote them all down. Um, soon discovered that that if you sit, if you sat on the on your own in the corner of a restaurant with a notebook, writing things in it. It's a you make a very different impression than some kind of lone, tall, white dude, smelly from days of travel on his own in the corner of, of a restaurant. You just look more enigmatic. <laughs> and uh, and like what else are you gonna do? Read or write. This is pre-smartphone, remember. So I was writing everything down, uh, and these ideas, these impressions turned into stories. I suppose this is turning into another writing suggestion, but um you can kind of channel your impressions into a narrative mode if you wish to. You might see kind of, you might get a great metaphor about, or what you think is a great metaphor about the way kind of the light reaches you through, through the canopy of trees and you're walking underneath them. Just see if you can give that a little bit of a narrative twist. Like what if it's not just the light, but if, if the same thing is happening to sound? And what if the sound is actually voices? And what if the voices are saying something? And then what are they saying? And then immediately you sort of into narrative. Um, so I was just, I suppose, without realizing I was doing it, I was encouraging myself to do that, maybe teaching myself how to do that. So my travel jottings were turning into stories. And I was on the road in on backpacker length bus journeys across China of 16 hours a piece. What else was I going to do? So, so I wrote stories well, and one per place. And after about the third one, I noticed they were, I noticed a common theme, which was they were about causality. And this is kind of one, one of my archetypal themes that will be with me until the day I die. I'm quite sure. I'm just interested in why things happen and why things don't happen and why things, why things go then one causal domino topple and not down another um and yeah etc um and so by about the fourth story by the, by the time i think i got to mongolia I, I was thinking okay so let's let's do a story about another reason why things happen why things might happen in this story etc cetera, etc cetera. if you've read my first book to be starting to sound this will start to be sounding a, uh, a little familiar and um that became uh, these became interconnected short stories um, not heavily interconnected, but something happens in each one that brings about the existence of the next story, uh, like a like a nine part domino, a topple. Uh, um, met Mike Shaw actually, the agent of Curtis Brown, um, as uh, as I was going through London. When I got back to Japan, I sent him the first few parts. Didn't hear much for a while, but then one. Saturday morning in Hiroshima, we were still in the age of fax machines. Uh, a fax came through when I switched it on in the morning and uh, and 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 it was to say he'd got a, well, that was my first book deal for 5,000 uh, pounds. Deathly silence. Um, I was and, gonna ask it whether you know how much that would be sort of in today's money. I'm sure there are still book deals for 5,000. Um, it, was, it, it was an off the rack one, uh, it wasn't, and give it the day job it was a two book deal first one for five thousand second for 15 you would have to ask um an industry insider to which you have much uh, more reliable access than me i think but um so it wasn't giving it the day job but it was a statement of intent uh and it was uh you know i, I still remember every detail of that morning uh just you have a few mornings in your life don't you um where 
where where you started a new chapter. Sometimes you know it, sometimes you don't, but sometimes you know it. Uh, and sometimes you might be wrong, but I knew it. It was a new chapter. And as it turned out, I might easily have been wrong, but yeah, I was right. Um, that was, I think of that morning as my first real morning in my life as a writer. Uh, it's a good feeling. I still remember it. Hello, it's Artemis, the producer of Always Take Notes. I hope you're enjoying Simon and Rachel's conversation with the fantastic novelist David Mitchell. It's time for the next instalment of our segment where we share bonus material from previous guests of the show. This week we hear from the novelist and non-fiction writer Amanata Fauna on a time in her career she failed. A time that my writing hasn't gone so well is usually whenever I attempt a short story and I have learned that I'm really not a short story writer. I am a novelist. And when I teach people um, creative writing, you can always tell the short story writers and the novelists. And so I get my young students to write me a pitch. I say, okay, write a paragraph about what the story is. And sometimes when I read the paragraph, you know, they've got plots and subplots and everything else. And I say to them, that is not a short story. That is a novel. Last year, I accepted a commission to write a short story because I, it was the year of COVID and you know, we were all so embattled and I thought that'll get the creative juices flowing. And that's about the first time I really had just looked at the blank screen and thought, I have no idea, <laughs> no idea what to write or how to write it. I got it done in the end, but it was, it was a painful process. That was Amanetta Fauna. And if you were interested in what Amanetta had to say, you can listen to our full episode with her via our website. Now back to Simon and Rachel's conversation with David Mitchell. Well, speaking of moments that you that are invested with meaning either at the time or sort of with hindsight, at what point did you know that Cloud Atlas was going to become become a hit? Um, I never did um, until way after it was published, really. Um, well, maybe it was a sequence of little moments, but I didn't quite believe them. Uh, Jonathan Pegg, my editor at the time, who succeeded Mike uh, when Mike retired, just, yeah, he, it, the, there was something in his voice when I, I, I'm i still a bit of a complete mess after I send uh, the manuscript off to my editors. I, I never quite know if I've uh, just shot my career in the foot just now with that book, with, with this new thing. So I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit of a mess until I hear back. But I'm also now old enough to realise that that's actually a good thing. You should feel you should be feeling that if you've sent a manuscript in and, and, and you're thinking, oh, they're going to love that. Uh, you're in trouble. Uh, but that's not your friend, that voice. So some uncertainty is good. But um, it's just something in Johnny's voice. Wow, well, well, this is interesting. Um, I, I remember that. My mum loved it. The first thing I done, she, she said, this is, this is a bit different, Dave. This is... Um, yeah, well, her, her, her exact words, I think this will make you famous. Oh, mum, bless, oh, bless. No, um, but, uh, and, and I'm not famous, and famous in, is entirely relative, and I still get the comedian David Mitchell's um, tweets, which is hilarious, because they're usually really angry at him, uh, and they come to me instead, so I forward them to him. Uh, so uh, this isn't, um, uh, this isn't a, uh, a trip about fame, which is something you should never look in the eye anyway. But it was sort of a moment in kind of my relationship with the book's reception. Then I suppose uh, just a really pleased email from my editor, Carol Welsh at Scepter, who's still my editor and, and is great in so many ways, just to say that Richard, it, it had been selected for the Richard and Judy Book Club. And here is the number of extra copies going to print on the back of that. And it was a six figure number extra extra copies uh, oh okay yeah this doesn't normally happen does it uh i was right it doesn't normally happen uh but if it happens for you once then and then then it's a great blessing and staying with cloud atlas what had made you or, or inspired you to take this this ambitious and, and pretty complicated structure for the novel so these six nested interconnected stories again did did you kind of feel your way into that or did did you was that the point of departure that you wanted to try and do that point of departure and it's worth saying it didn't occur to me i said this refrain and be repeated it didn't occur to me that it was audacious or, or i mean i knew it was a bit different but i didn't think it was suicidally risky 
I just thought, well, okay. I read it for a winter night traveler by Italo Calvino, uh, a book which is a sort of eternally postponed Scheherazade without the payoff, where a narrative is begun, got about six, seven pages into, interrupted. Then there's a frame narrative about you, the second person reader, second person character who just read that text, trying to find its continuation. And just when you think you've got it, it turns out to be another one, which you then read. Uh, and that's really good as well. You want to find out what happens next and on and on and on uh, for about 12 times you keep that up for. It was good and really clever, but I felt a little bit, mm, it's, 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 it's sort of like a, um, if you're a kid and you're into rock and then you hear a jazz guitar solo, you think, oh, that's kind of great, but where's but kind of, where's the David Gilmore? And it, it didn't quite have the thing. So I had that idea back then, just as an 18 year old reading that, but what did it actually look like if you, were to, if you put a mirror at the end and then got all of uh, the payoffs, all of the part twos of the story, but in, in reverse order. Uh, so it's narrative A part one, B part one, C part one, D part one, E part one, F, then D part two, E part two, C part two, B part two, a part two. I think I did that without a mistake, well than me. So the idea for the structure was first. Number nine dream, uh, God bless it, the uh, booker for reasons best known to the judges had given me a short, uh, had, had, uh, had, had given that book a nomination. And that just encouraged me to be, a, to, well, okay. If I think that's a bit of, if I think that's an oddball book, wait till they see this one. It's, it, it, it didn't, it, uh, had I been, three books in, three more books into my inverted commas career, uh, I, I, I would never have done it. But my ignorance of technique saved me there. So I wrote it and um, I just, I just wanted to see what, I just wanted to see what would happen. Would it work? Would it be incoherent nonsense? I, I, I suspected it might work, but I didn't have a clear model to point to and say, well, that worked, so this will work. I, I suppose I had this, uh, it's like, that slight in, intoxicated feel of maybe kind of being a little bit of a pioneer in that form of the novel. In reality, I'm not. There are always people you either have or haven't heard of who have tried things before you. Uh, and in some form or another, many of these people have the same name, William Shakespeare. He was there first in most respects, even when we're talking about novels, a form which he predated. But but yet I still had that slight kind of, oh, <laughs> um, I, this is new ground here. Let's see what happens. So so I did. Yet one thing led to another. And, um, and, and I wrote the book in about a year and a half or so. Um, in my back bedroom up in the UK in Herefordshire with a kind of infant half the time balancing my infant daughter on my knee, uh, trying to get to go to sleep, writing it with my right hand because I had to keep her sort of had to stop her from falling onto the ground with my left hand. Um, that's, that's, that's sort of how I wrote Cloud Atlas. Uh, and it'll probably be, I mean, if, 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 if anyone's interested enough in writing me an obituary, ever, it'll probably be in the first line, uh, that book. But, but that's okay. As I say, if, it, if, 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 you, if a book like that happens once to you in your career, then, then, then you know, you should be grateful. You should be duly grateful. Is that quite typical that the format of your stories comes to you almost fully formed or is it was it a lightning strike uh it's atypical uh so no uh first first and pretty much the only or joint only time that the structure's there first uh usually you get the structure wrong usually you're about at least in my case 30 40 50 000 words in maybe and everything's fine and all the characters and the plot's looking good and you're just working out what the ideas are so that's plot character ideas language is probably okay so, so so like what's not working uh something isn't and often at that point think about the structure um and that's going to need rebooting it'll and and by doing that you're going to sort of maybe have to switch the emphasis on who the story is about uh a bit but but that sort of roadblock is useful information that roadblock's there for a reason and listen to it and often in my case it's okay structure it's you again uh, i've got to sort you out haven't i 
and then I do and uh, and then you might have to rewrite the manuscript and 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 kind of what you thought was your gleaming marble rococo edifice just turns out to be the scaffold uh, it, it was just the scaffolding for the real thing all along but again that's okay uh, it's uh, it's it's not okay if you don't listen to that voice and gamely soldier on thinking it's a question of willpower uh, that can lead you into trouble and building on rachel's question there the perennial question that we always put to to fiction writers and particularly novelists on the show is whether they're a, a plotter or a plunger so whether there's someone who has plot worked out beforehand be that in post-it notes or in a document or whether they dive in blind and follow their nose or whether they lie somewhere between those two poles and where do you fall on that spectrum I'm probably somewhere between a um, a plunger uh, or a plutter. Uh, so yeah, uh, in the middle somewhere. Um, you've got to get in at some point for me, otherwise you never get started. So plunge in an ungainly fashion and end up with your face in the mud. Uh, but only when you're there can you kind of really see the lie of the land at least that, at least that's how it is for me my metaphor is actually you're going on a road journey through the alphabet you know what c is is that great scene with what's his face is going to say that you know what f is is that the thing you wrote 15 years ago that gorgeous bit of dialogue you've always been looking for a home for you know what o is it's something based on that brilliant piece in the new statesman you read six months ago and and you not you don't know why but that's going to go into a novel at some point uh etc etc there's 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 these points but you don't know how to get say from a to c you don't know how to get from and then once you get then when you once you're at c you're not quite sure how you're going to get from d to e f g say but until you're at c you can't see the view from c so you don't know which you kind of don't know what the alternatives are. So you keep going. Momentum's important. No one will ever read your first draft. This is very important. Your first draft, uh, and, and I've heard writers as eminent as Neil Gaiman say this, your first draft is rubbish. It's supposed to be rubbish. It's allowed to be rubbish. Just get the damn thing done. It's a bit like novel zero. Just get it done uh, and find the bits in it that aren't rubbish. And that's, those are the, uh, the true paving stones of your real novel, uh, which can come after. Usually when you're stuck, it's because, in my case, it's because I don't know the characters well enough. All I have to do is to sit down, okay, who are you again? Where are you from again? What do you think of the other people in this book? What do you want? What do you really want? What do you tell people you want? And what do you actually want? And what do you want but you don't yet know you want? Just think of, if you just think of, if you just put these questions to yourself, then what I've heard called, or what I've heard referred to as writer's block just doesn't really happen. Um, not for me. Maybe I'm lucky. Uh, and I suspect it might be that uh, rather than the notion of writer's block not being a thing, because lots of other eminent writers have referred to it. So I guess I have to believe it exists, but I've never really had the trouble myself. Uh, when I've had something like it, just think about the characters. They're why you're here. They're why the readers are here. You have a fantastic plot, but unless it's got, unless it's happening to and from just interesting people, in most cases, uh, no one will care about it. Uh, you care about the emotional connections with these fictitious people. I suppose also a handful of occasions where, for whatever reason, I just can't write the scene yet. It might be an emotional reason, or it might be because of because what I just said isn't 100% true and it's merely mostly true and I, and I do think about the characters and I still can't write the damn scene. Just, there's no harm in leapfrogging it then. Just, uh, if, 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 if you can't write scene O, then go to scene P and pretty much always then you'll work, scene, you'll work out scene O backwards. Once you've done scene P, you think, ah, okay, as I was at N, that ends there, that's pretty good uh, and here's scene P. So clearly, let's sort of helicopter in this scene and connect the two nicely your master of the alphabet is it's very good <laughs> oh, i've been working on it for a while thank you thank you thank you <laughs> it's one of my superpowers <laughs> well i was going to ask is how research fits into it is it something you go along you do as you go along or is it something that you do before you start writing do all the research you need to get plunging 
then start plunging because otherwise research just becomes a postponement activity uh, and in you go and then you will soon hit scenes the further away from your kind of core of knowledge you already have you stray uh, the sooner you will think okay yeah i'm gonna have to find this out but we live in the age of the internet there's no excuse you, you don't know how lucky you are you young writers when i was a lad you had to get on your bike and go to the library to find out how people shaved if you were a lower middle class clerk in the dutch east indies company and the year was 1790 was there soap was there shaving cream would you have made it yourself would you got a slave to do it would you got a servant to do it um was it available would you've used hot water cold water if it was hot who was heating it uh, would you have shaved yourself would there have been a barber what would the barber have used it is um i mean I, I, that's that's an example that comes to my mind because i did spend the best part of the day researching that very thing but 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 in the age of the internet uh is that don't dare complain. <laughs> Dickens did all of his stuff without like, without any of this. He did it pretty much without libraries. You know, he just had to ask people, know people, work it out, guess, bluff. It's also um, a rule of the podcast that we always ask about money and how it interfaces with people's writing lives. So be as, as candid or as guarded as you want with this, but as your career progressed from writing alongside doing a day job to being able to write full time, how did how did those elements develop. I saw in another interview you said that you were kind of blessedly free from commercial considerations when you're you're doing your writing. How is that part of it all works? It kind of intersects with my personal life really. Um my now wife um we were in Japan um she was expecting our first kid um we had to make a decision do we do we do that here uh where I'd have to continue to teach just because of something as prosaic as uh, the exchange rate. So uh, number nine dream of second novel had done pretty well cloud atlas wasn't out yet but i'd got a, a kind of um a, a somewhat expanded and enhanced third and fourth book deal for cloud atlas and what became black swan green uh, on the back of that uh, it was enough for us to sort of for me to not need to work if we were in the uk or in this part of the world uh it wasn't enough because of the exchange rate if we were in japan um so was I going to be at home and be a hands-on dad or was I going to go out to work and teach uh, at the college I was in teaching at? Uh, kind of on the flip of a coin, we decided quite late on in my wife's pregnancy, okay, it's the UK, uh, let's go the writer's route. It wasn't very cleverly thought out. Uh, it could have gone horribly wrong, and but not horribly wrong. Uh, we could have gone back to Japan and, and, I, and, and I would have um, recommenced some kind of teaching work and we would have been fine but um but we came to the uk and then just by great good fortune my sort of most commercially successful book was my third one we needed somewhere to live we came to ireland uh at that time until uh, the crash of 2008 uh, um, ireland had a very friendly tax regime towards writers musicians and breeders of racehorses and i wasn't the last two but i was the first and we've kind of been here ever since as you'll know from interviews with American writers, if you live in a country with a, a functioning medical system uh, with a health service, uh, this makes a huge difference. Pretty much all American writers, even eminent ones at the highest level, some kind of professorial academic attachment is necessary for this prosaic thing that we all take for granted, health insurance, health you know um if 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 you get a major unwelcome a diagnosis or someone in your family does what's going to happen to you uh and the answer is really different if you're depending on what patch of earth you happen to be a resident of uh so i've been a full-time writer since then um i've i've done bits and te bits and pieces of teaching work along the road but kind of out of curiosity because I wanted to, never because I had to. Uh, I just sort of wanted the experience here and there just to see what it felt like. Kind of. um, and I suppose also one of the reasons I'm grateful to both the booker, even though I've never been a winner, but but it, I, I just had that little magic dust at just the right moment. Um, it, um, it, it, it persuaded or encouraged my publishers to think okay probably this seems to be working let's 
leave them alone <laughs> and they have done ever since uh I, I'm, I'm i've i've got a good relationship with with both my us and my uk publishers uh my uk one has been the same ever since number nine dream all the way through to utopia avenue carol welsh i i essentially hand in i, I write what i want to write i hand it in i get uh, a bit of really helpful feedback I generally take most of my editor's advice with the manuscripts that's kind of my story as a writer i suppose we're coming up against our time limit but the final question from me you mentioned pursuing projects just out of curiosity and to sort of scratch an itch is that why you've pursued writing projects in opera and film and tv as well is it just because you were sort of curious about how those formats and genres worked yeah yeah maybe i uh, I was perhaps a bit uh, too diminishing of my motives uh although curiosity is a great thing nothing wrong with curiosity uh it's probably it's, it's some kind of a crucial ally i think um if you do have a career then it behoves you to think about it as a career uh and as an artist uh with a small or um uh, an uppercase A, how are you going to avoid repeating yourself? There are more people publishing books in their 20s, 30s, 40s than in their 60s, 70s and 80s. And how come? It's not that people, I think, well, I'll be able to give you a more informed answer when I'm there. Um, I'm 52 now, but I don't think it's because people forget how to write novels. It's likelier because the compost heaps that you take nutrients from, that you take stuff from, locations, ideas, experiences that you put into your work. That's what you build up in your youth in most cases. Uh, it's youthful experiences, um, especially if you do become a full-time writer, if you're not doing something else, if you're not a doctor like Chekhov or I don't know, a chemist like Primo Levi or, 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 or a, um, other examples are flowing from my mind, but you know what I mean. Um, if you are a full-time writer, I think that compost heap kind of gets smaller and smaller and and a kind of diminishing returns cycle can kind of kick in unless you take steps to replenish that compost heap with 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 other experiences now if you've got kids you can't just sort of do what i did uh, do what i do what i did when i was 26 and take the trans-siberian express for the best part of a year or however long um but in your choice of collaborations or, or or in your choice to collaborate uh you can explore other narrative forms like libretti or like film uh and go into it with the mind of a student again um what do you know about narrative that i don't kind of you script writers uh and the answers can be really instructive well no they are really instructive always uh they might not be applicable but even thinking about why they're not applicable, that's instructive. You, you can't kind of lose. Um, and so these sort of holidays that I've taken in, in, in other narrative forms. Um, my home is still the novel. That's still my home art form. And that'll always be the case. I love the damn thing. Uh, it's big, baggy, forgiving, uh, cranky, ramshackle, um, 300 year old, ever evolving form. I love it. Uh, but little holidays in, in, in other, maybe slicker, uh, maybe more glamorous narrative forms. Uh, uh, I, uh, I've, and, and, and continue to treasure these experiences because of what I learned there. So as Rachel said, we're coming up right against our time, but a final question from me would be about Utopia Avenue and about the experience of writing about music. You know, the, the analogy that it's like dancing about architecture or things like that. I mean, how did you decide to approach that and then how did you, you kind of go into writing a novel about this this band your quick question i've realized more and more uh, is not quick and not deep how did you decide to write that novel uh when an author gives you a quick one sentence answer to that question why did you write this it's always a line it's always a spiel uh it might be really good it might be true usually is true but it's only it, it's it's only the, the outer layer of the onion. Why this novel, not others? Um, I don't know. Uh, I just love music. I've always wanted to write about it, and in my queue of impatient, grumbling novels waiting to be written, this one elbowed its way to the first, uh, elbowed its way to the front, and and it was its turn. Um, but I don't know why. 
I don't know why it is in the queue in the first place because of who I am. I don't know why it elbowed its way to the front of the queue because it was argier, bargier than the others. It had sharper elbows. I don't know why. Um, but I just knew. There was no doubt uh, when I finished Slade House. Okay, it's you now, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Uh, I've been thinking about it for years, but I think about all my novels for years, long before I start writing them. Uh, they, they circle above an airport in a holding pattern, waiting to be told it's their turn to land. Um, I've got quite a few up there. Uh, they'll see me out, I can tell you. Um, uh, the challenges. Uh, well, maybe a part of the reason why it was its turn. It's, it's an impossible thing. You can't dance about architecture, can you? You can't write about music, can you? Music, uh, writing their symbols on pages or on the screen. There's a lot of processing decoding in your brain to turn those symbols into other things which somehow flicker onto the screen of the imagination uh, each time each reader they're different different every time to quote a rather beautiful song by robert wyatt uh music's the opposite of all that that's not that music isn't symbols music is physical sound waves it's molecules moving in the air to particular patterns it it thumps into your ear canals it bounces off your eardrums that's converted into something else it's physical and it just it's it might have words it might have lyrics but that's not how music works uh, uh um lyrics bereft of the music is is like a ship in dry dock it just sort of sits there in a somewhat ungainly fashion in most cases um and music is mysterious, it's enigmatic, it's beyond language. You can write a, a you write 10 pages about Bohemian Rhapsody. It'll be turgid and unreadable compared to the song. Just play the song. So how can you marry those? How can you make that oxymoron work? How can a novel be about music? How can I do that? And I just love those little impossibilities, those 12 impossible things before breakfast. Um, the answer is long, but uh, essentially every component of the novel Try and I tried to repeatedly, indefatigably wrestle it into some musical bent or musical flavor or musical fashion, musical mode. Could I make the structure musical? How could I do that? What would that look like? What does that even mean? And then I had the idea well, you make the structure of the novel like three LPs. There's a three LPs at the band Utopia Avenue record, and the chapters are songs. And you're going to flip them over the way you used to flip over vinyl. Uh, that's that's you turning the page from one section of the book to another section. Uh, the characters, clearly musicians, they're steeped in music, they think music, they dream music, they love music, they hate music, they do it. Uh, they, they've got the calluses on their fingertips to prove it. Uh, the plot, obviously, we can make that about music, that's no great. How about the, the language? Can you make the language musical? What does that mean? Um, is some language more musical than others or some languages more musical than the others? Because you make, is, is the experience of being on drugs, is that sort of somewhat like, is that a different music? Would that be represented? What would Joyce do with that? <laughs> Just ask yourself these things and, and um, no one has to see it unless it's any good. I suppose that's sort of, uh, if, 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 if this is a somewhat, well, this is something of a how-to podcast uh and if there's one takeaway from this how-to podcast then then i'd like it to be this just write the damn thing don't agonize over making any good yet that could come later no one has to see it just just you and you will find things i promise you even if it's mostly rubbish you'll find things that aren't rubbish and that's what you work with so that's your job that's your that's how you discharge your, your responsibility to this beautiful, glimmering, shimmering, gleaming thing of literature that's in your head that you want to write. You're in a job of serving that. You're, you're its midwife. You're going to bring that into being. Uh, how do you do that? Well, firstly, you write a load of rubbish. You write a rubbish version of it. Uh, that's the absolute necessary first step. You, 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 you won't begin to bring this into being unless you do it so get to work nothing's holding you back only your ideas it has to be brilliant first time around 
no one's brilliant first time around. It's it's almost always rubbish. It's okay though. You go sifting through the rubbish for the um for the for the little little gravel size pieces of gold. Well, that's a perfect note to end on. Thank you, David, for your time and for this enormously instructive episode of Always Take Notes. Oh, you're really welcome. Uh, thanks for your indulgence. And I've really enjoyed uh, speaking with you both. That was the Always Take Notes interview with David Mitchell. He's on Twitter at David underscore Mitchell. And his latest book, Utopia Avenue, is published by SEPTA. We wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. If you pledge $10 a month, you also get a free two-month trial to Otter, worth $26, alongside the other rewards. Otter offers automated transcription and live note-taking for in-person and virtual meetings. I found it to be a huge help when organising interview material. Thanks again for supporting Always Take Notes. Hello, it's us again. Simon, what was your takeaway from the great chat that we had with David? I thought he was a very uh, gentle man in the sense of, um, you know, he just seemed very gracious. Uh, He was very kind to speak with and kind of fitting that thing that we've had pleasingly on the show of some very distinguished writers who seem to have kind of checked their egos or or kept their egos in check um it was great and and again fascinating as we've done so many times on the show to like unpick the sort of uncertain origin story of a smash you know to get a sense of when something was going to be very big and very major what about you i mean other than the fact that i'm still cringing about a joke i made about the alphabet during <laughs> that interview um i yeah completely echo everything you've said um he's been on my kind of hit list for a while um after listening to his desert island discs which i'd also recommend um anyone whose interest has been piqued by this episode to check out um it was great to lift the lid on his process and his uh approach to research and writing and also his sort of family circumstances as well on a slightly different note simon what have you been up to lately uh, I've been juggling two different magazine pieces at different stages. So one um, that the reporting is largely done and kind of working out how to structure it. Uh, and the other sort of doing some um, initial looking into a, into a new situation. So um, kind of nice to have two pieces at, at different stages. Um, and I, yeah, I worked through the too much of the long weekend, which is a, a freelancer's hazard. Rachel, you've been, you've been unwell. Well, I've had COVID. Luckily, it's been quite mild. Um, but yes, as listeners can maybe tell in my voice, I'm still a little bit croaky. Um, yeah, so I also was indoors throughout the whole long weekend, but it did give me the opportunity to delve into a biography of a pioneering plastic surgeon. Um, so a review of that is coming very shortly. So not all wasted, but not particularly fun either. <laughs> well, good good to hear you're on the mend. This has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our score is by Jess Danheiser, and our graphic design is by James Edgar. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Always Take Notes, on Instagram at Take Notes Always. If you'd like to support our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're on there under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.